Okay, so today we will talk about what is called the Chinese remainder theorem. So, the typical problem is the following, find the smallest natural number n such that n gives a remainder of 3 when divided by 8 and gives a remainder of 10 on division by 21. Okay. So, let us try and see what we would do to uh, solve a problem like this. So, firstly let us rewrite this using our notation of congruences. So, recall uh, the first condition just becomes n is congruent to 3 modulo 8 and the second condition is that n is congruent to 10 modulo 21. And so, this is really a system of simultaneous congruences. Okay, we are trying to solve two congruences which needs to be sim which need to be simultaneously true. So, let us try and uh, go about this in one way which is a sort of a brute force approach. So, here is a trial and error or a brute force method is the following you write out all possible solutions to one of the congruences. Okay. So, list all solutions to one of the two congruences. For instance, here let me pick n is congruent to 10 modulo 21 and let us write out all the values of n. So, recall from last time this just means the following that, so let me write down some values of n here. So, I am only looking for natural numbers. So, n equals 10 is one possibility and then since it needs to be congruent 10 mod 21, all you need to do to get the rest of the solutions is to keep adding multiples of 21. So, I have 10, I add 21 to it, I get 31, I add 21 to this, I get 52, then I get uh, 73 and so on. We write out a few more 94, 115, 136, 157 and so on. The list keeps going on, but uh, for now I will stop there. And now what do we do? Well, we remember need to also solve the second congruence. So, this list of numbers of course, solves the first congruence. So, let us figure out what remainders these numbers give us when divided by 8. Okay. So, here we will write down the remainders when, di when divided by 8. So, let me call it remainders modulo 8. So, I will divide 10 by 8 and get a remainder of 2. If you divide 31 by 8, 31 is uh, let us see 24 is the nearest multiple of 8. So, this gives a remainder of 7. 52, 8, 6 are 48 and you are left with a remainder of 4 and so on. So, let me write out the next few remainders. It is a 1, it is a 6, this is a 3, this is a 0 and a 5. Okay. So, now you scan through this list and you find that the number 115 also satisfies the, the second condition that we want. So, we also want n to satisfy n congruent to 3 mod 8 and of course, that is exactly what we want. right? So, the solution that we are interested in is the number n equals 115. Okay? So, we have solved the problem here n equals 115 is the smallest natural number which is congruent to 10 mod 21 and 3 mod 8. Okay? So, that is sort of a brute force approach here. Now, uh, let us also ask the following modification of this question, what are all solutions? So, suppose I want to know, uh, so here is a modified problem, find all, let me say integer solutions. So, I am even allowing negative integers now, find all integer solutions n to the following congruence. So, n must be an integer. Uh, satisfying the very very same two congruences n congruent to 3 modulo 8 okay so we have found one solution we have found the smallest natural number solution to be 115 but now this question says can you also find out all solutions okay so all integer values would satisfy these very same congruences so, here is the, the key observation here. So, here is the answer to this, this question. Uh, suppose I have another solution. So, I know one solution now, one solution has been found by our trial and error procedure to be 115. Okay? 
Now, here is the, uh, the key point. Suppose I have two solutions to these congruences. Okay? So, suppose A and B are solutions. So, suppose I have two solutions A and B. So, A is congruent to 3 mod 8. And what are AB? Let me say AB are integers satisfying A congruent to 3 mod 8 and 10 mod 21. B satisfies the same relations. B is congruent to 3 mod 8 10 mod 21. What can one say about A and B? Okay. So, let us do the following. Observe that if you subtract A minus B. So, let me call the difference to be C. Let C be A minus B. Now, what do these properties imply in terms of C? Since A and B leave the same remainder modulo 8, A minus B as we observed last time must be a multiple of 8. So, observe that C is in fact a multiple of 8. Okay. So, 8 divides C. Similarly, A and B give you the same remainder on division by 21 implies A minus B must be a multiple of 21. Okay. So, there are two properties that C satisfies that C is divisible by 8 and by 21. Okay. So, now let us see what this implies about C. So, we claim that the fact that it is divisible by both 8 and 21 implies that in fact C is divisible by the product of 8 and 21. Okay. So, the claim is that uh, 8 into 21, so that is uh, 168 in fact divides C. Okay. C is a multiple of 168 and let us prove this. So, proof. So, what do we know? We know that we are given that C is a multiple of 8 and that C is a multiple of 21. So, 8 divides C 21 divide C and we want to conclude that C is a multiple of the product of these two numbers, okay, which is 168. So, how do we prove this? Well, we start out by thinking of the prime factorization of P of, of C. Okay. So, recall we said last time that every integer has a unique prime factorization. So, here is the prime factorization of C. So, what are the various, so what does prime factorization mean? It can be written as a product of various prime numbers. An alternate way of uh, expressing the same thing is to write C as a product of powers of the various distinct primes. So, this is probably more familiar. You can write C as, so what are the various primes involved? So, there is 2 power, so 2, 3, 5, 7, 11 and so on are the, are the initial primes. So, you can write C as some power of 2, so let us say 2 power alpha times some power of 3 times some power of 5, 7 and so on. So, imagine you write it as products of powers of all the prime numbers. Well, there can only be finitely many prime numbers involved. So, there is some p power something. Okay. So, I do not really care. Okay. So, this is what C looks like and what we know is that this expression is unique. Okay. You cannot have two different ways of writing C in terms of powers of primes. Now, what do we know about C? We know that 8 divide C. Okay. 8 divide C means that, well, 8 is just 2 power 3. Okay. So, observe 8 is 2 cubed. So, C must be a multiple of 2 cubed. That is the, the thing that is given. So, what does that mean? The prime factorization of C, here is the power of 2 that appears. The power of 2 had better be at least 3. Okay. This means that the power of 2 which appears must be at least a 3. Only then can 8 occur as a factor of, of C. Similarly, 21 is 3 times 7. So, it is 3 power 1 times 7 power 1. C is a multiple of that. Implies that there must be at least 1 power of 3 and there must be at least 1 power of 7. Let us call it delta. Okay, and the rest of the things I cannot say anything about. But at least I have concluded that the prime factorization of P must have you know, at least a 2 cubed appearing, a 3 power 1 appearing and a 7 power 1 appearing. Okay. So, the, the final expression for C therefore looks like 2 power, it is 3 plus something. So, this, this power here is at least a 3. So, let me think of it as there is surely a 2 cubed plus in addition there may be uh, you know more powers of 2 involved. Similarly, there is at least a 3 power 1, there is at least a 7 power 1. Okay. These factors are guaranteed to be there. 
in addition there could be other other things ok. So, let me say C therefore, looks like this times D where D is some some natural number where or some integer. Okay, so, observe I, I did not quite assume that C is a, a positive integer. So, it could be that it is a negative number, okay, but that does not affect any of the arguments here. So, if C is negative I will just put a negative sign in front, okay, but the final thing is true I will if C is negative I will think of D as being negative. Okay. So, anyway so the point here being that this is 2 cubed whereas that involves 3 and 7. Okay. So, there is a special property of these numbers that we have used. So, so by the way we have finally proved what we want C therefore, is written as 8 into 3 into 7 that is exactly 8 into 21 or 168. Okay. So, we have finally written C as a multiple of 168 which is what we wanted to prove. Okay. So, our claim is proved. Now, observe there is one important fact that we have used uh, which really makes this whole thing work which is that 8 and 21 do not have any common factors. Okay. So, what makes this proof really tick? is the following fact that 8 and 21 have no common factors. Okay, and we will we'll see this point again. So, what we have managed to do is two things one we have found one solution by a brute force approach and then we have we have said the following that uh, any two solutions have the following relation that their difference must be a multiple of 168. Okay. So, let us complete the solution to the problem we asked. So, we said find all integer solutions thus here is the conclusion how do you find all integer solutions to the, the original set of congruences uh, all you do is you take one solution and you add any multiple of 168 to it that is the only way you can get another solution. So, thus here is the conclusion the set of all integer solutions to those two congruences is well the set is exactly the following you take one solution which is 115 plus any multiple of 168. Okay, where k can be any integer. Okay. So, here is the full set of solutions and why is this true? Why does this follow from what we just proved? Remember 115 is one solution and suppose you have any other solution. Okay. Then the, the thing we just did says you take the difference between those two, two guys then that difference is a multiple of 168. Okay. So, you take 115 and any solution take their difference the result is a multiple of 168 which automatically means that the other solution had better have this form should look like 158 plus a multiple of 168, 115 plus a multiple of 168. Okay. So, this is, uh, uh, this is an important observation to make that somehow the fact that these two numbers do not have a common factor is what plays a role here. So, suppose we did not want to actually find the solution, but maybe only wanted to show or be convinced that a solution always exists. Okay. So, here is an alternate approach. Okay. And uh, let us do the following, let us write out. So, I will sort of frame the problem at the end, but for now let us consider the following. Let us take the same two numbers 8 and 21, observe 8 times 21 is of course, 168 as we just said and let us do the following. Let us make a list. So, let us write down all the numbers. So, of course, I am not going to be able to do this, but imagine that we write out a list of all numbers from 1 through 168 and now I am going to make a table. So, I am going to write out all the numbers let us say I write out 1, 2, 3, 4. let me just go a little further 8 maybe until 11. So, imagine then that you keep going like this. So, let us just pick some random thing in the middle uh, let me say 27 and then I keep going all the way to 168. Okay, so, 27 just some random entry somewhere picked in the middle. 
So, here is the sort of table that I make, I write down all numbers from 1 through 168 and there are two more rows here where I will tabulate the following. I will look at the remainder when n is divided by 8 and by 21. Okay. So, I am going to uh, extract two pieces of information. So, I am going to say n mod 8 by which I mean the remainder on division by 8 and n mod 21 is just the remainder on division by 21. Okay. So, let us tabulate these, these values. So, for instance, the number 1 when you divide it by 8 or 21 will just give you remainder 1. Okay. Similarly, the number 2 is just going to give you a 2. So, uh, nothing interesting happens at first. These numbers just give you back the same things as remainders 7, 7. Now, comes the first uh, time when something interesting happens. The number 8 on division by 8 will give you a remainder of 0 whereas, on division by 21 of course, just gives you the number 8. Okay. So, 9 is remainder 1, 9, 10 is uh, 2 on division by 8 and just 10 on division by 21, 3, 11 and let us look at so and so on. Uh, let us look at 27 on division by 8 is 3 because 24 plus 3 is 27 and on division by uh, 21 gives you a remainder of 6 and you keep going till the very last fellow is a multiple of both 8 and 21. So, when you divide by both 8 and 21 it gives you 0. Okay. So, what you now have is the following you have you know a table of numbers from 1 through 168 and uh, a tabulation of their remainders modulo 8 and modulo 21. Now, think of this as pairs of numbers. So, the number 1 is sort of encoded by the pair 1 1, 2 corresponds to 2 2 and so on. So, 27 for instance corresponds to the pair 3 comma 6, 168 is the pair 0 0. Okay. So, I am sort of encoding each number by the pair of remainders that I get on division by these two fellows. Okay, so, think of it as some kind of code. Now, here is the thing, uh, let us set up, so let us call these pairs, the set of these pairs as something, I will call this set as t, let it be the set of all pairs of numbers x comma y, where remember what can x be, it is a number between 1, uh, well 0 and 7, y is a number between 0 and 20. Those are the possible remainders on division by 21. Right. So, the pairs x comma y are these fellows. So, that is the set T consisting of all such pairs and the set S let it just denote the set of all numbers from 1 through 168. Okay. So, I construct these two sets. Now, the first observation to make is that the set T also has 168 elements. Okay. Just like the set S which obviously has 168 elements, the set T also has the same number of elements. Okay, and why it is clear because the elements of t, so the, the elements of t are just pairs of numbers x comma y and the for the first entry x you have 7 or rather 8 choices numbers from 0 to uh, 7 and for the second entry y you have 21 choices. So, the total number of choices number of ways in which you can form pairs is exactly 8 times 21. So, it is clear cardinality of t is 8 times 21 cardinality of S is of course, the same and now what we are doing here by means of this table or this encoding that I am just talking about is defining a map. So, here is the encoding map if you wish which is doing the following, it is taking any number between 1 and 168 and sort of encoding it by a pair of numbers x and y where what is x? It is a remainder that you get on division by 8, y is the remainder that you get on division by 21. So, where what is x? n is congruent to x mod 8 and y mod 21, x is between 0 and 7, y is between 0 and 20. Okay. Only then will it be an element of t. So, here is the encoding map if you wish. So, let us give the encoding map a name, let us just call it f. Think of this as the encoding and now here is the, the uh, natural question you can ask, what sort of properties does this map have? For instance, is this encoding a faithful encoding? In other words, can two different numbers lead to the same code? Okay. So, I would ideally like codes to sort of be faithful in the sense that I would want different numbers to be encoded as different things. Right. 
So, let us ask that question is f a 1 to 1 function? Is f 1 to 1? In other words, can it can it happen that I have two different numbers n and m which lead to the same answer here to the same code? Can such a thing happen? Okay. So, let us consider this. So, let us call uh, suppose there are two numbers n and m. Suppose n is not equal to m. So, what are n and m? n and m are elements of the set S which are not equal and suppose it happens such that their codes are the same f of n turns out to be the same as f of m. Then let us see what we can obtain from this. Okay. So, what does it mean to say f of n is equal to f of m? It means well that n is congruent to 3 mod 8, but then m is also congruent to 3 mod 8. So, n satisfies these two properties uh, sorry uh, not 3, but rather if this is x comma y then it means that n is congruent to x and y mod 21 and the same property is true for m that m is also congruent to x. So, recall our congruence can also be written like this m congruent to n just means that you know they both give the same remainder on division by 8 that was our definition. So, they both give remainder x on division by 8 they both give remainder y on division by 21 and we have just done this argument. So, this of course implies that the difference m minus n is divisible by both 8 and 21 and hence by 168 right we just said this. So, this is divisible by 8 and 21 hence by their product which is 168. Okay, so, we conclude that m and n must in fact differ by a multiple of 168, but observe that cannot happen because n and m to start with were elements of s. Okay. Elements of s just means that they are numbers between 1 and 168. So, n is a number between 1 and 168, m is a number between 1 and 168. So, if you take their difference, well what are the possibilities that and, and they are not equal to each other. right? So, the difference cannot be 0. So, the point is that the difference could never be a multiple of 168. Okay. So, the the only possibilities are n minus m. So, maybe another way of saying this is if I have two numbers between 1 and 168, what can I say about their difference or the absolute value of their difference you wish. So, you know what is the words the farthest they can be one of them can be a 1 and the other can be 168 that is the only way in which you will get a very large difference. So, and that is just a 167 difference. Okay. So, modulus of n minus m can be at most 167. Okay. So, what does this mean? n minus m is therefore a number between plus 167 and minus 167, but it is also supposed to be a multiple of 168. So, you know this the only way that can happen is if it is 0. Okay. But we also know that 168 divides n minus m. So, the only multiple of 168 that lies in this range between minus 167 and plus 167 is the multiple 0. So, this just means n minus m had better be the multiple 0, but that is a contradiction because we assume that n is not equal to m. Okay. So, what this implies is that f is in fact a 1 to 1 function or in other words this code is a faithful code and what does it imply? Let us come back to this function here. So, we have just concluded that yes f is 1 to 1. So, this cannot happen. So, this fellow had better go to a different point, but now recall that both these sets have the same numbers of elements both have 168 elements f is a 1 to 1 function automatically implies that f is an on to function okay? because what is the image of s under this function? Well, every you know every fellow here maps to a different point. So, the total number of different points that you will get in the image is exactly 168. Okay. So, the image has size 168, but the set T also only has size 168. Okay. So, the image had better equal the entire set T. Okay. So, yes and further this implies that F is also on 2. So, what does that mean? It means that 
this encoding function has the following property. No matter which x comma y you pick in t, okay, which means you pick any number x between 0 and 7, any number y between 0 and 20, you will always be able to find a number n between 1 and 168 such that n is congruent to x mod 8 and n is congruent to y mod uh, 21. Okay. So, let me just write the final conclusion here of this, this argument. So, conclusion f is on to implies the following given any x and any y between 7 and 20 respectively, there exists a unique a unique number n between 1 and 168 such that n is congruent to x mod 8 and y mod 21. Okay. So, the original problem we asked of finding uh, the case where x is 3 and this is 10 is only a special case and there we explicitly found the value of n to be 115. More generally, no matter which pair you pick, okay, so you can just pick anything you want and you will always be able to find some number n which has that particular encoding. Okay. So, it is a, a somewhat surprising fact at first, but here is a proof, a non-constructive proof, an existence proof which tells you it can always be done. Okay. So, what we look at next time is a way of actually doing this constructively in, in a somewhat more systematic fashion than just doing brute force.